Hello, every Hello everyone, uh, and most welcome to this event with Peter Altmaier. My name is uh, Carl Isaacson uh, from CREAB. <clears throat> uh, and for those of you who have not uh, participated in this event, CREAB is a public affairs agency based, in, based around the world, but we are based in Brussels. Uh, we have another very timely event. Uh, we just chatted here right before we opened the event that uh, we set the title Global Economic Challenges Ahead uh, a few months ago when we did not know how huge these challenges would be when we have the event. Anyhow, I will soon hand over to Charles and John to lead the proceedings. I just want to say that I've, we at CREAB very much look forward to having, having uh, these meetings in, in physical um, in our office very soon. And I think even the, the next meeting, you will have a chance to, to come to our office. Uh, the invitations will be sent out uh, very soon. So with that, thank you for being here. And I hand over to Charles first, I believe. Thank you very much, Carl. And it's, I'm really happy to see Peter Altmaier uh, at a seminar, see our seminar again. It's a while since we've had him on a seminar. I remember just even before he was a minister in the, the very early days of the CER, him coming all the way to a, a, a conference we held in, in the city of London and him speaking there. He has an extraordinary career as a minister throughout Angela Merkel's chancellorship. I remember seeing him in the early days when he was deputy minister of the interior, then he became chief whip, then minister of the environment involved in the energy vendor, then head of the chancery for several years, and a special responsibility for the refugee crisis when it, when it came in 2015-16, then uh, deputy acting minister of finance after Wolfgang Schäuble left the job, and then for, for many years recently minister of economy and energy, where he took a particular interest in industrial policy, which is, I think, something we're going to focus on today. Um, and I think those who follow his career closely know that Peter Altmaier has always been a committed European, which is why the Centre for European Reform has always been happy to work with him. He's uh, very much in the, in the, in the, in the Helmut Kohl, Angela Merkel tradition of European integration. He's always been a strong believer in Franco-German friendship, and that coming from the Saarland, that's not surprising. But also, he's always been a great believer in involving the British as, as much as is possible. And I know he's many times spoken at the Koenigswinter Conference, which brings together British and German thinkers and politicians. So without any more from me, Peter, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the economic challenges. After your long, long and varied career in government, um, how do you see the challenges and what do you think the EU should be doing? Uh, yes, thank you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Peter. I just, uh, I'm going to ask my colleague, John Springford, who's an expert okay. on okay. policy, okay. To, uh, to, to moderate the session. I'm fine. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, please do go ahead, Peter, and then um, I will I will take over for the Q&A. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Carl. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction, for hosting me today. Um, uh, I'm a pensioner now, but of course, um, in these uh, crucial days, um, I have, um, I feel really um, familiar with all the European uh, political decisions and challenges uh, ahead of us, still familiar because I was dealing with them um, on behalf uh, of my ministries, but especially um, as a uh, firm and convinced supporter of Angela Merkel for more than 20 years um, uh, back in Germany and, uh, and in Brussels. Uh, of course, there have been always crucial days, uh, but we are living crucial days um, uh, in, two, um, in two aspects in particular. Now, first is, of course, uh, Ukraine that I would like to mention uh, prominently. Uh, I mean, we need a strong signal, signal of support for Ukraine, not just a single, but uh, concrete measures. Uh, of course, uh, this is not NATO uh, territory. Uh, we are not um, taking part in the military actions, uh, but uh, the Euro Ukrainians are Europeans. They are basically a democratic uh, country um, and it's in the interest of all of us that we can avoid um, uh, enormous um, 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 misery, uh, slaughter, um, and slaughter, and um, all these uh, kinds of things linked to a military aggression and um, war. The second thing is that um, we are facing a crucial decade, a crucial decade as far as the role of Europe. Uh, on global scale is concerned. When I'm talking about Europe, 
I'm not talking about the European Union um, alone. I'm talking about the UK, about uh, Norway, about uh, all the other countries, not a member uh, of the European Union, but member of one big uh, economic uh, region in the world. Uh, Europe has lost a lot of its um, military power uh, after the First and the Second World War, uh, but we have become instead uh, the biggest um, uh, economic power center of the world. For quite a long time, uh, we are still the industrial powerhouse uh, of, um, of the world uh, in many, many aspects. Not only uh, when you look at German um, uh, car uh, manufacturers uh, um, and uh, machine industry, uh, but in many other areas as well. We are strong. We are a stronghold as well in financial services. Look at the city of London, uh, look at uh, Paris, uh, Frankfurt, and uh, Luxembourg. Uh, but without our industrial capacity, uh, we would not be uh, in a position to maintain our standard of living, to maintain our economic strength, uh, and to play um, a leading role in world affairs in a in a um, uh, in the future uh, anymore. And that means we have to take on the challenges uh, ahead of us. And these um, challenges um, are uh, basic challenges. Uh, first of all, uh, as far as uh, the geographical disruption is concerned. Um, we have uh, seen not just China, but a number of Asian countries uh, becoming um, not just emerging countries, but industrialized countries. Um, there are um, several billion people living in Asia. Uh, market economy rules are implemented in many, many regions, at least partially. There is a economic growth uh, of a pace that is twice, three times, sometimes four times bigger uh, than in uh, old Europe. Um, and that means, and that means that we have an enormous interest uh, in um, uh, remaining involved um, in this uh, global uh, exchange uh, process. Uh, I know there are people arguing in the, uh, the past uh, uh, that we should see China as a systemic rival. Yes, of course it is. But um, uh, one thing uh, I want um, uh, I want to add to that: uh, first of all, uh, never take on more than. Uh, two uh, opponents uh, at a time. Uh, we are now trying to stabilize uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Ukraine. Um, and second is, um, uh, I wonder whether Europe, the Americans or others, would be ever able, even if they would try to do so, uh, to stop the um, uh, economic uh, success of the uh, all these countries in Asia, Indonesia, India, China, uh, Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh, and so many others. Uh, so the, the only chance I can see for a good future for all of us would be uh, to, to make the rules of global trade, uh, of um, rule of law uh, in economic relationship uh, accepted by everybody in that region as long as we can serve as a role model for others because we are still uh, economically strong. And therefore, we have to take on the second disruptive challenge, which is the um, technological disruptive. Never before we have seen so many uh, technological disruptions uh, at a time. Um, one is, uh, it has been uh, largely discussed uh, over the last decade, the uh, digital uh, uh, challenge ahead of all of us. Uh, but uh, frankly, Europe has not yet catched up enough. Uh, certainly not. When you look at data economy, um, at the big hyperscalers um, uh, uh, organized uh, by the big American uh, players, by Microsoft, uh, by Amazon, uh, and also in China by uh, Alibaba, uh, and you compare it uh, to the scale of storage capacities in Europe, um, then um, it is a big, huge difference. This is why we have launched in Germany first, and then together with the European Union, the Gaia X project. Companies uh, in the UK are admitted. Some of them are participating. 
and we want to establish a sovereign European based data infrastructure that is not exclusive. Companies like Microsoft and Google are participating in the exercise, uh, but we want to host more data in Germany. We want to know and to decide on the rules um, as far as migration of data is concerned, as sharing of data is concerned, we need it. And what we need as well is a bigger role of Europe in the platform economy. Platform economy is so important uh, for our industrial success uh, nowadays. All the big uh, platforms, uh, business uh, to customer, uh, are of um, have American or Chinese citizenship. And the only really big one, Booking.com, uh, that has been a European one, a Dutch one, has become over time um, a uh, American platform as well. Uh, we are strong with regard to B2B platforms. We can become, we have to become stronger, but we have to put more attention to this. I add autonomous driving as well. And the classical industrial political uh, areas um, where Germany uh, is strong. And talking about uh, IoT, Internet of Things, that means that uh, the machines will be closely connected uh, with uh, the internet, with the web. And the big question is who will be in the lead, the web, uh, the internet, or the machines? And this is something uh, where we have to succeed, where we have to make clear that we are building uh, the cars of the future, even autonomously driving cars that we are uh, uh, that we are able to connect our machines uh, in a learning way uh, using artificial intelligence uh, solutions. I have launched uh, as a minister of the economy in 2019 uh, a concept for an industrial policy uh, of Germany. It has become um, it has become uh, the, um, the origin of a debate on industrial policy during our presidency in 2020. Now Europe has an industrial strategy. I think it is a good one, uh, but it is uh, not yet sufficient uh, to master uh, this challenge. Uh, and therefore, I think we have to spend more time. We have to think more uh, about it, especially when it comes to the third disruptive challenge ahead of all of us, and this is the ecological disruption. The European Union, uh, and in close uh, cooperation with the UK, uh, has adopted um, the Green Deal. And that is a promise to become climate neutral by 2050 at the latest. It was a big promise. It was a big move. And it was a risky one in the beginning because what would happen uh, in other regions uh, in the world? Would they use it um, as a good um, um, as a good opportunity to bypass uh, Europe in terms of competitivity? Uh, and fortunately, I must say, so far it is not the case yet. The Americans, the U.S., the Canadians, the Japanese, the South Koreans, and it is not officially announced yet, but I believe also the Australians um, have um, uh, aligned uh, their ambitions uh, to our European ambition to climate neutrality in 2050 is now widely accepted. Even the Chinese have made an effort and they have announced they will become climate neutral by 2060. Many people say, oh, that's good news. That's good news now that the point is clear and and it's solved. No, it is not yet solved at all. Uh, because imagine China would reduce its emissions uh, in areas not being part of global competition uh, until 2050, and then reserve the remaining 10% uh, until 2060. Then they could possibly have a competitive advantage uh, when our uh, steel companies would be obliged to produce green steel without any um, uh, uh, CO2 emissions at all. And our chemical industries and others would be obliged doing so. And compared to the already existing Chinese industrial strategy made in China 2025, it was uh, decided in 2015. Uh, and it was not so widely noticed uh, in Europe, unfortunately. 
um, then, uh, but it was honest, it is, it's very honest. It indicates where China wants to lead the world, where China wants to become a champion, uh, where they are ready to invest. Um, and all these areas are indicated um, and they have even organized mergers of all the railway companies uh, in China uh, in order to be more competitive on the world markets in Africa, in Latin America and elsewhere. So we have to respond to that. Uh, and we have to do it branch by branch. I've in uh, Germany organized a dialogue with my steel industry, with my chemical industry, uh, with other branches of industries uh, to define what we need to meet on the one side our ambitious climate, tar climate targets and on the other side uh, uh, to, to remain competitive because this is a life insurance uh, for the welfare uh, and for the the influence uh, of Europe uh, on a global uh, scale. So I hope uh, that we all together, the European Union, UK, and the US, will be able to establish uh, an agenda. An agenda that uh, would, of course, respond to the Russian uh, aggression. Uh, it is never, can, may never be accepted, uh, but we have, in parallel, the responsibility to keep the economy churning, to um, improve the competitivity uh, of Europe, to spend the money, not exclusively uh, for nice gadgets um, and um, useful um, uh, expenditure uh, as far as social protection, others are concerned. I'm not against it, I'm in favor of it wholeheartedly. Uh, but we will have to accept that for every euro, for every dollar, for every pound sterling we are spending uh, for climate protection, we will have to spend at least one uh, euro or one dollar uh, for the competitivity, for the transformation of our industries. Uh, and that is huge because uh, it means in the future car production means e-cars, no longer cars with combustion engines. There will be a transitional period. Uh, but we will have to become the world champions with regard to electric vehicles. Uh, in Germany, the biggest uh, uh, Tesla car factory uh, in Europe uh, is going uh, to become operational these days. But it is just a beginning. It is far from being enough. Uh, to overcome the challenge. Um, these are uh, a number of points. I'm sure that uh, the participants uh, will have uh, lots of uh, questions. So I stop here. I say thank you for uh, listening uh, and I'm ready to take your questions and to answer them as good as I still can. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, that was a great sort of overview of where we are in terms of industrial strategy and the disruptions that the European economy is going through.